All right. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining me today for this webinar. I'm Dr. Tiffany Rao. I teach at the California uh, State University Fullerton um, Teacher Education Program, specifically in the Department of Special Education. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about building a classroom library that rep represents all students. I am so excited about this topic. I had so much fun preparing this webinar today. So thanks so much for joining. Thank you for investing this time over the summer on a Saturday morning in your professional development and uh, in your students. And if you're joining us on this recorded uh, webinar later or on YouTube, thank you for tuning in. So, okay, let's get started. First of all, here is the link to these slides. So if you are watching a recorded version of this webinar, you can just hold your phone, um, go to uh, camera and hold your phone over this QR code and it will pull up the slides for you there. Uh, yes. So first, uh, I'll just briefly, in case you're not really familiar with what a representative library is, what is the point of it, let me just give you a brief introduction. So uh, it's a library that is diverse in its characters and stories, representing the students in your class as well as the greater community. Students, especially those who are underrepresented, really benefit from reading stories featuring characters they relate to in terms of culture, lifestyle, identity, etc. Reading about characters that they can relate to who tackle big obstacles or go on exciting adventures builds their confidence and gives them a sense of belonging. And it provides all students an opportunity to learn about cultures or experiences different from their own, which promotes empathy and an understanding of the world around them. So when you take the time to carefully cultivate a classroom library, that represents your students, where students will see themselves reflected in the literature, number one, it's just a good teaching practice because research shows us that when students feel a sense of belonging, when they feel connected to you, and when they feel connected to the content, they just do better academically and socially. So that's a win. But secondly, when you are taking that time, choosing books and thinking about who your students are, this is an act of deep caring in your teaching so that you can make sure that your students feel seen. So it's very, very rewarding as well. And it's really fun to find different books that are going to represent your class. We have a few more people trickling in. So I am just gonna take a second and share the slides in the chat. And that way you can access the slides. All right. So where to begin? Um, after this slide, I know this is very text heavy. I promise it's going to get more. I'm going to share some resources and I'm going to share a lot of books today um, with you. But this is still the introduction. I want to build this foundation. Where to begin? First, you want to take stock of your current classroom library. If you've been already teaching, um, if you're going to be a brand new teacher or you're a second year teacher, um, the chances are that you inherited a classroom library from maybe a teacher who was retiring, or it's just kind of a hodgepodge of different books that people uh, gave to you. So it's important to take stock of that library. Some of those books might be very old. Even if they're not that old, it's important to look at your uh, books through a critical eye and identify any stereotypes based on race, ability, mental health, et cetera. I'm going to give you some resources to assess your classroom library in just a moment. But what you'll do next is decide if you do have some books that seem to portray people of various cultures or identities in a way that is um, sort of like a caricature 
or in a way that could cause pain or harm, then you have to decide if you're going to remove those books. And if you believe that they are causing pain or harm, then I recommend removing those books. But otherwise, if they might not cause pain, but they're just not really up to par with your values now to uh, create a diverse library, you might use them as tools for discussion. You'll want to consult any school policies, see if there is a banned book list with uh, your school district to inform your decision. You might consult your principal if you find any books that are seem especially problematic. If you keep them, you might choose to label them, like say with a yellow sticker or something like that. And that is like um, to alert students that these have some ne negative stereotypes. And then you can lead some discussion about those stereotypes and how it could be written more inclusively. So you don't necessarily have to get rid of all books, but again, let your let your guiding question for that decision be, is this going to do any harm? You want to do no harm to your students, right? First and foremost, that's the first rule is do no harm. But there are some books that could lead to some really interesting and engaging discussions. If, if your students are emotionally ready to handle those. So that might be more for fourth grade and up, but there are some that if your students are ready, it might be like second grade, you might um, consider some of that. Books that aren't telling the stories of marginalized people respectfully um, can be used to spur conversations about why those texts can be found offensive. But what I'm gonna share with you today is there are many new diverse books that have been published that are really exciting and represent cultures in positive ways. So here is one great stereo, uh, great resource on books with negative stereotypes. Uh, I'm not going to click on this, uh, but I'll just tell you about it and I'll show you a screenshot in the next slide. So here's the QR code and of course the link if you have the slides. This is from the San Francisco Library and they list uh, a several books that have negative stereotypes that they've actually chosen to keep in circulation uh, for in order to spur discussion or because they just have been requested to keep for various reasons. But they list them on the website and they discuss the, the issues with those books. So here is one example. It is a Dr. Seuss book from 1950 called If I Ran the Zoo. And this is what they say about it. The Seuss we've all grown to love leaves more to be desired in the stereotypical illustrations of different cultures. Depictions of Chinese, Middle Eastern, African, and Russian cultures are negatively stereotyped. The people are exaggerated, like the imaginary Seussian animals in the story, while the white characters bear no stereotypes. So I think it's a really useful website to consult. And then uh, here is a website where you can assess your class library using a checklist. So let me go over to, to that website really quick. Bear with me because this one I think is just really good. Okay, I have it open over here. Here it is. Okay, so it is uh, called an equity audit, self-assessing your classroom library. So uh, up here it says inclusive re representation. My collection contains books that include positive and affirming representations of main characters who are white. Is it none, some, many, or all? Uh, characters of color, characters of color with very dark skin, characters who are bilingual or multilingual, 
immigrants, refugees, LGBTQ+, disabilities, and diverse religions or traditions. And then it just goes on. Female or women identified, people of color, get, digs deeper into that, families, storylines, stereotypes. So really a great tool to gauge uh, some of the books that you already have in your circulation. All right, go back to this. One second. There we go. Okay. And it's important to make sure that you are also including books that represent joy in diverse uh, communities and identities, not just hardships. So you wouldn't want to have this diverse collection of books, but realize that all of the uh, books that represent um, marginalized people are about hardships, while all of the exciting kind of heroic, you know, uh, battles and, and pursuing common interest books are, are featuring white characters, right? So it's important, of course, to tackle the different moments, the difficult moments and histories of diverse communities, but it's also important to represent joy, represent those communities doing fun and exciting things like battling magical creatures, or just uh, trying out for the, you know, the uh, school baseball team and common interests like that. And you can also invite your students and their families to contribute ideas. So if you have older students, um, you might give them a poll for what kind of books that they enjoy, uh, or just ask them directly, what are some of your favorite books? And also seek Input, for, input from the families about the kind of books they enjoy reading together at home. Their input may also help you choose books that would directly benefit some of your students, such as books featuring maybe a young person with anxiety or a physical health condition that you may not have known about before talking to that family. So where to find diverse stories? They are becoming more and more prevalent, so it's not going to be too hard. But here are some, um, some resources. Diversebooks.org. This is a great resource about where to find diverse books. They offer some different links uh, to websites where books can be purchased. Um, so you can check that out when you have time. I am going to go to this website. I had so much fun on this website. It's called diversebookfinder.org. And I actually made a list and checked out some books to share with you today from my local library. So let me head over there, share that again. Okay, here we go. Diversebookfinder.org. Uh, really, really cool website. So let me show you a couple of, um, just a couple of highlights from this website. They have highlighted books. So that I think is a great place to start. So they have a list of books that they're highlighting right now, I think this month. And then you can go to previous months. But also... This is just a highlighted search engine right here. So uh, activism, adoption, clean water, immigrant refugee, um, multiracial families, Muslim. So if you know that you're gonna have uh, you know, two or three uh, Muslim students, then you might start right there and find a few uh, books to integrate into your library. Um, Side note on that, so your library is never complete, right? The best kind of classroom library is 
ever evolving and ever changing. I used to have so much fun going to my own light local library and loading up with, I'm not kidding you, 20 or 30 books to bring into my classroom library. And then, you know, I'd have them for three weeks. The kids would get really into them. They were always so excited when I had this new, uh, you know, this new collection of books for them to explore. And then I'd return them and get more. And that was fun for me. I really had a blast doing it. And my students would catch on my enthusiasm. You know, your enthusiasm as a teacher is really contagious. So it's a great way to bond with your students and get excited over books. So uh, you might look at your students before the school year begins, take a look at their files and bring in some books that represent what you know so far about the students. But of course, you're going to get to know them all throughout the year. You're going to have new students. So you want there to be sort of a rotation in your library. Your library does not need to be complete. You can have a starter library and then add to it and rotate as the, um, as the year goes on. Okay. So back to this website. Uh, there's highlighted books, and then there's the whole collection. And so this is really great. Let's say you want to find books about autism. So you just put in autism, and then it's going to show all of these books that you can look for. So you don't have to, you know, search the library stacks or go on Amazon and buy books. You can find books. And here's one, My Life with Autism, A Friend for Henry. I'm going to share this one with you guys today, a Manual for Marco. Uh, my brother, Charlie, um, Benji, The Bad Day and Me, all of these students feature, I mean, all of these books feature um, a character with autism. Now, the farther you go, sometimes it's not so much about autism, but, or about whatever you searched for, and it kind of gets away from that. But anyways, so what I did in preparing for this webinar was I used this website and I just searched for a whole bunch of um, different things. And then I looked up um, on my phone, uh, on my library website, I was just going back and forth between you know this website and my library website to find the books that they had in stock. I wrote a list and then I went to um, the library and I was in and out of there in less than 10 minutes with a big stack of books that they had ready to go. It's really fun. Okay, back to the slideshow. All right, here we go. And then here's another resource that you can check out, socialjusticebooks.org. And then here are a couple of resources on diverse books in Spanish. There are a lot of books available in Spanish. Uh, these are two resources that will list a whole bunch of them for you as a starting point. Um, also, I'm going to give a little plug for my next webinar. It's going to be on August 13th. It's Author's Corner, where I will talk about um, highlighting like an author of the month kind of a thing in your classroom. And I am going to feature um, at least a couple of Latino authors there that have books in English and Spanish and really highlight um, Latino characters, of course, as well, and families and culture. So if you're able to come back for that, uh, that one was also really fun to plan. I'm just putting the finishing touches on it right now, but it's been so much fun. I'm really excited about that one as well. Um, also check uh, authors' websites because like Eric Carl, very uh, famous, of course, prolific uh, children's book author, passed away in 2021, unfortunately, but um, he has a lot of his books also available in Spanish. So always check because some of the, the beloved books that you already have in rotation might also be available in Spanish. And if you have a lot of English learners, it's great to include those books as well. So 
Once you have a list to start with of books that you'd like to include in your library, like I said, I went to my local library. I don't want you to spend any money if you can help it. I know sometimes it's fun to buy books and you might choose to spend your own money, but if you can avoid it, it just really adds up once you start spending your own money. So here are some free options to build your library. So of course your school library for one thing is great and your local library. Um, most local libraries will let you check out like 30 to 40 books at a time after the first time that you check out. So if you don't maybe have a library card for your local library, the first time they'll let you check out like five books because they have to make sure they can trust you to return them. And then after that, they will let you check out a lot of books. I always took full advantage of that. But also you can start a wish list at donorschoose.org. Um, and you can share this with wish list with your families if it seems appropriate to do so. If a lot of your families are low income, then it might not uh, be the best thing to like ask them to spend money. But um, you can share it with your own friends and family, post it to your Instagram or your Facebook or whatever you use. Uh, but also there are people with money to spend out there, strangers who want to support education and want their money to go directly into teachers' classrooms. So put it out there and you never know what you're going to get. There are people that want to fulfill entire wish lists or they'll buy one thing from a bunch of different teachers wish lists. So it's definitely worthwhile. Same thing with Amazon. You can create a public wish list. I have seen influencers at, at sharing random teachers, Amazon wish lists saying, Hey, do you want to support a teacher in my local community? Here's a wish list. I just bought a few things. Let's clear out her wish list or his wish list. So you just never know. Like I said, there are people with money who want to spend it on teachers. So put it out there and see what happens. Okay. And a few tips, and then I'm going to share some books, and I'm actually going to do a, a few read alouds, um, a very short picture books that I really, really love. But before we get into that, make sure that you are doing your due diligence to research how to pronounce character and author names, okay? A quick Google search is usually enough. So, um, you know, I know it's, somewhat common. I'm sure you've had this happen or you've seen this happen where someone will kind of, they're sort of have this tone of self-deprecating, but they'll say something like, oh, I'm going to butcher this name. So I'm not even going to try, or they'll make up a nickname that's easier for them to pronounce. Don't do that. Okay. The way that you can show that you really respect people is by learning how to pronounce their name correctly. Take the time to do this. It is well worth your time in showing students that you care to pronounce not only their names correctly, which for sure you should be doing, but anyone's name. You're going to show the, everybody respect in pronouncing their name correctly. There is a an ugly history behind um, giving people nicknames, you know, like for white people giving people nicknames from other uh, races just because it's too hard to learn how to pronounce their names. It's not too hard. It just takes a couple of minutes. So invest that time. And I'm not saying that you guys would do that. I'm just giving you a little bit of the background and the history there that we need to change that and uh, really invest this time. Now, if you forget, it's okay. If you open up a book and a character has a name that you're not sure how to pronounce or the author, you want to talk about the author and you don't know how to pronounce their name and you forgot to look it up ahead of time, that is okay. That's an opportunity. You can pause and say, you know, I'm not sure how to pronounce this name and I want to make sure I pronounce it correctly. So let me just grab my phone and I'm going to look this up so that I can make sure to give this name the respect it deserves. You are modeling that level of respect for your students. So that's a great thing. I recommend maybe doing that on purpose sometimes just so that you can model that to your students. 
Okay. I have this big book, stack of books to show you. I'm going to read three short ones aloud. I hope you don't mind. They're so good. I really wanted to share them with you. They're all so good, but of course we don't have time uh, to read them all, but I'll, sh I'll just at least show you the covers. Um, okay. So let me stop sharing and we'll read this book together. All right, here we go. Okay. So this first one is called A Family is a Family is a Family, and it is written by Sarah O'Leary and illustrated by Chin Lung. Uh, so let's get into it. These are all picture books and they're very short. And I chose those because I have, I, I can read them. We have time for that. So I didn't include all, uh, older books or more advanced books for my read aloud, just because we don't have time, but, uh, I will share at least one with you. And of course there are a lot on those, uh, resources that I shared with you. Okay. So we were talking about families at school. The teacher asked us what we thought made our family special. I went last because I wasn't sure what to say. My family is not like everybody else's. My mom and dad have been best friends since first grade. They really like each other. It's kind of gross. So this is what one person, one student shared. These are all things that the students shared about their families. And you can't really see it, but uh, her mom and dad are kissing at dinner right here and she's all grossed out by it. Another student said, there are lots of kids in our family. Mom and dad just keep coming home with more. Both my moms are terrible singers and they both like to sing really loud. We have a new baby in our home. I think my mom ordered him online. We all look alike in my family. We just kind of go together. One week mom gets me, the next week dad does. Fair's fair. Some people say I look like my dad and some people say I look like my mom. I think I look like myself. My mom says that before I was born, I grew in her heart. Because I live with my grandmother, people sometimes think she's my mother. She's not, she's my everything. Some of the kids were dads when he met mom. Some were moms when she met dad. Now we all belong together. One of my dads is tall and one is short. They both give good hugs. I listened to everybody else. And then I remembered the time someone saw us all together at the park. She asked my foster mother to point out her real children. Oh, I don't have any imaginary children, mom said. All my children are real. A family is a family is a family. And that's it. I love that book. So representative. Second, let me pull this up again. Okay. All right, so that was uh, this book. And here was, is what I would suggest as follow-up activities for this book. Um, so the teacher asked in the book, the teacher asked the students, what do you think makes your family special? Now, a quick side note about that. While some of your students are going to be ready 
to just talk about everything, maybe more than their family cares for them to share. Um, some of your students are going to feel like that's a really personal question, and they might feel kind of anxious and put on the spot. Even if they come from a very traditional family, it might just feel really personal and they're not ready to open up to a whole group. So you could read this in a small group so that it just feels a little bit safer for those more guarded students, or you can give them some different options. So what I would probably do is I would read this as a whole group because I like that uh, for read alouds. And then I would ask that if anyone wants to share, would you like to share what makes your family special? And if you don't want to share, I'm going to give you some different ways to share by drawing a picture or whatever it's going to be. So I would uh, open it up to volunteers to share verbally. And then um, some options would be to have your students draw a picture of what makes their family special, you know, depending on the level of your students. Uh, maybe they would write a few words or sentences or a paragraph and then illustrate that. I also like the idea of making this um, into more of an extended project that they can take home and maybe they could bring in some photos of their families or create a scrapbook page and then add it to a class family scrapbook. Create a digital scrapbook page if you like to do more digital things. Um, or even have students interview maybe one family member or each member of their family using that same question, what makes our family special, and then record the responses, either jot down their responses in writing, or if they just interview one family member, they could even um, do an audio recording, especially if they have iPads that they take to and from school, if they have school iPads. So you can get really creative. And then how to generalize this is when you're reading another book that features a family, like so many of them do, you can circle back. What makes this family special and have a discussion about that? Okay, the next one is called Lulu, the One and Only by Lynette Mawinney and illustrated by Jenny Poe. So let's go back to this. Here it is. And this one is about a multiracial family. My name is Lulu Atwa Lovington, but everyone calls me Lulu. It means pearl in Arabic. Being in a part black and part white family seems to confuse people around us. They say a lot of mean things to us because they think we don't fit in. Kids tease Zane. You're the blackest guy on the team. The coach is really your dad. Oh, I missed a page. Um, so mama tells me you are unique and gorgeous, just like a black pearl. She wears these beautiful earrings all the time. They're from her mother in Kenya, Kenya. And then it talks about her brother Zane. Sorry, I skipped that. When I play in the park, the other moms always think mama is my sitter. What do you charge? We're looking for one, they say. When I'm out with daddy, some people think I'm adopted. That's so nice that you gave her a good home. Where did she come from? Everyone else might be confused, but I'm not. I love our family. But being a mix of mama and daddy always brings around that question. I hate that question. What are you? What are you? So what are you? What are you? What are you? Zane, do people ever ask you what you are? Yeah, it's annoying, but that's when I use my power phrase. Your power phrase? It helps people understand who you are, not what you are. I'm proud of our family and that I'm brown, but I'm more than my skin. I want people to know what's inside me too. When I get that question, I tell people I'm magic made from my parents. 
dad taught me how to play hockey and I love to study space because of mom. You know how good I am at so many things. Mom and dad have a ton to do with that. Wow, Zane is really smart. Now I need a power phrase too. And I need it fast. But how do I found, find my power phrase? The question is not what I am, but who I am. I'm a good singer. I'm fast and strong. I'm loving and kind. I am a black pearl, unique and gorgeous. I've got to get this right. The next day, Billy asked, hey, Lulu, what are you? It was time. I'm Lulu Lovington, the one and only. Cool, said Billy. Do you like to sing? We sat together at lunch and sang our favorite songs. The real treasure is inside, just like an oyster holds a pearl, and just like me. Lulu Lovington, the one and only. And in the back of this book is an author's note with some really great um, like talking points. It's actually written for families, but I think that you could apply it to the classroom just with a few tweaks. So, On. Okay, so some follow-up activities. Well, first, the follow-up discussion. You can be open and talk about what it means to be mixed race and give examples in a matter-of-fact approach and tone. So you might say, if, if you have any personal experience, if you're mixed race or you have a friend who's mixed race, you can just say, you know, it means like I have a friend who's half Korean and half Black, or it means maybe that, you know, your mom is... Um, is Muslim and your dad is Latino or your dad is from Mexico. So just very matter of fact. In that author's note, it mentions that an estimated 7 million people in the U.S. are mixed race and they deal with that question. So I think that's a great uh, fact to share with students so that it really normalizes it and helps. Uh, if you do have any students that this applies to, helps them realize they are not alone. So you can talk about a power phrase that it's a tool to help kids respond to that question. And it's okay to say I'm half Korean and half black, but it's also okay to come up with a different response like Lulu and Zane did. And you can discuss why it was so annoying to Lulu and Zane to be asked that question so much. So a few more activities that you might do is as a class, you could come up with friendly questions to ask people that help you get to know who they are that have nothing to do with their race or ethnicity. You can also have students complete an all about me activity uh, or illustrate a self portrait and include some descriptions about who they are, what's special about them. I really like these last two ideas, though, because um, we do so much all about me, right? Sometimes it almost feels excessive. We, we all do that. So you could switch it and make it an all about my classmate activity. So instead of a typical all about me, they would interview a classmate and then create a portrait or a project showing what's special about that classmate and then maybe sharing that with the class. Or you can make it an all about us partner activity where they work with a classmate and they make one project that shows both of them and uh, highlights the special things about them. Okay, the last book I'm going to share with you is called A Friend for Henry. This is by Jen Bailey and Mika Song. And this is about a boy with autism, although it never once says the word autism. And I actually like that because not everyone with autism wants to be like outed uh, with that autism label. And certainly a child can't really con uh, consent to that. But if you have students on the spectrum, also this would apply to just students who are very sensitive and introverted and kind of particular about things, but it is about autism. It's about, it's an autism, considered an autism awareness book. Uh, and it, let's get into it. It's really great. 
a friend for Henry. If you came to our in-person workshop back in July, you already heard this, I'm sorry. I shared it there too. A friend for Henry. In classroom six, second left down the hall, Henry was looking for a friend. This kind of centered. It couldn't be Gilly who circled her fishbowl. She's quiet, thought Henry, but she can't play on the swings. It couldn't be Mrs. Magoon who knew about hugs. She shares, thought Henry, but she has to. Could it be someone else in classroom six? In art class, Vivian shared Henry's double easel. Vivian was a kaleidoscope, a tangle of colors. She had ribbons and clackety shoes. She knew every pony song and her fingernails were painted like rainbows. When I get paint on my fingers, Henry said, I wash it off. Henry waved her hands too close to Henry's face. My mommy painted them, aren't they pretty? Painting on people is against the rules, said Henry. Did your mommy get in trouble? No. Henry lowered his voice. Did you get angry? Why should I? But Vivian was angry later. So I don't know if you can see this, but Henry painted her shoes with a rainbow. He ruined them, she said. She likes rainbows, Henry explained. And he thought a friend would say thank you. Reading time was Henry's favorite. My friend will like it too. It, it was Henry's turn to put out the carpet squares. He tucked the blue ones next to the brown ones, green in the very middle. All the edges met and the corners fit perfectly. Reading time, shouted Samuel, my favorite. Samuel was a thunderstorm, booming and crashing. He was kind of scary if you didn't have your blanket. He could pick up grounds with his toes and do proper somersaults. Henry stepped in front of Samuel. Somersaults are hard. Samuel dodged past. I want a green one. When Wait, Henry's throat felt tight. They're perfect. Mine's a magic carpet from a genie's lamp, said Samuel. It's not, Henry's face was hot. It's from Rug World. There's the sticker. Up, up and away, magic carpet. Booming and crashing. Henry's fingers curled closed. A friend listens. Henry, Mrs. Magoon knelt in front of him. Sit with me, please. Henry did, but he couldn't see the pictures and his carpet square was brown. During snack time, Jaden took two crack, two, took three crackers instead of two. At recess, Riley dug up worms and let them use the swings. At free time, Henry's hope for a friend felt small. He watched the sunlight play along Gilly's scales. He could watch Gilly for a long time. Katie watched too. Katie smelled like strawberry milk. She read storybooks all by herself. She slid down the big slide, sometimes backwards. The big slide is too big, said Henry. Gilly floated past. She's shimmery, said Katie. But she doesn't blink, said Henry. What does she do? She burps pebbles, Henry thought, and breathes underwater and turns sunshine into colors. Henry hunched into his sweatshirt. Fish things. Katie bent to have a closer look. I like her. Henry tried not to blink. Want to play blocks? Sure. I don't like triangles, said Henry. I don't like broccoli, said Katie. Together, they built a tower. It had rectangles, cylinders, and squares, but no triangles or broccoli. It's perfect, said Henry. Thank you, said Katie. The next day, they played on the swings, and Katie went down the big slide. 
Henry waited at the bottom for his friend. And that's the end. Love that one. And by the way, bring this back up. There we go. By the way, this author, Jen Bailey, uh, the, A Friend for Henry is pretty new. I want to say 2021. And she already has another one coming out in 2023 about Henry and another one planned for the future. So there are more coming. So uh, I would have a discussion. First of all, I think that Henry had a lot of self-awareness and he knew what he was looking for in a friend. I think those are real strengths for Henry. He knew what he valued in a friend. So you might consider having students create a vision board of friendship for Henry and maybe later for themselves. So you've probably heard of a vision board. A vision board is like, if you imagine yourself in five years where you wanna be in life, you can can cut out pictures or find pictures online and sort of create this board of where you want to be in life, okay? But you could do one for Henry about what kind of friend he's looking for. So here are a few visuals that I found just quickly online. He would probably be looking for a friend who knows how to be quiet and not too loud, a friend who likes the swings because he enjoys that. He also enjoys books. He likes his friends to do things correctly and be nice and neat and not put worms on um, on the, the swings and a friend who listens. He said that specifically. So the students could uh, maybe collaborate with you on this and then do one for themselves. This is also a great social emotional learning activity as it really covers um, friendships and relationship skills as well as self self knowledge. Okay, and then this one, this would be for maybe um, upper grade, even middle school. Uh, this is a chapter book. It's a novel. It is written, written by Sadia Faruqi and Laura Chauvin. It's called A Place at the Table. And it is about two sixth grade girls, Sarah, a Pakistani American, and Elizabeth, a white Jewish girl whose mom has depression. And Sarah's mom is teaching a South, a South Asian after school cooking class at school. And they're both in the class. So Elizabeth wants to be in the class because her mom doesn't uh, cook very much. And Sarah has to be in the class because her mom's teaching. And uh, it's it's a really great story. I haven't finished it, but my family and I started it on audiobook um, coming home from a road trip. And it's a really great story. And uh, I am a sucker for any book that features prominently food. And this one does. And uh, by the time we got back from our road trip, my mouth was watering. I actually hadn't tried um, like Indian or Pakistani food before. I had just never really uh, had the opportunity. And I was just, it sounded so good. It really goes into a lot of sensory details about the fragrances and about cooking. And so now uh, I had to try a recipe after that road trip that next week. I tried one. Now I have a couple of recipes that are in my regular rotation. They are so good. Okay. So just to um, kind of wrap this up and then uh, we'll have time for any of your own thoughts that you'd like to share or any questions that you might have. As I was uh, creating this webinar, I realized you know, I think of this as good teaching and and all you know any experts in education, are going to agree. Like I said, creating a representative inclusive library is good teaching, helping your kids feel seen, helping them feel connected to you and to the class is research shows um, leads to better social and academic outcomes. And it is also an act of deep caring. You wouldn't think that that's a radical uh, or political act, but you might have some parents that have a problem with you sharing stories that are diverse or short stories that mention, uh, you know, a child who has two moms or two dads or something like that. 
So I've shared a couple of really great resources for you to consult just in case a parent were to have some concerns. This first one over here is from truthforteachers.com and it comes from a podcast episode. It's specifically addressing critical race theory. That's not the topic that I'm talking about today. I'm just talking about creating an inclusive library, but the advice here I think would be very applicable to responding to any parent concerns, actually. It's really, really a lot of validation and listening and sharing your perspective, but without getting into minutia. And then over here, this is a library website in case library patrons have questions or don't like that you have a diverse collection of books. I think that could be really applicable to the classroom as well. But basically, you'll want to establish a good communicative relationship with your families from the start. And then if a family, uh, if a parent does come to you with any concerns, always this issue or any issue, always open up a discussion like that with validation. Like, thank you so much for reaching out about this and coming in to meet with me so that we could talk face-to-face -face about it. Your concern is really valid and I'm so glad that you brought it up. Um, and then you want to end the conversation with a similar sentiment. Always want to seek first to understand, then be understood. Listen with the intent to understand rather than rebut, okay? So really listen rather than thinking about what you're going to say. Um, validate, like I said, and you don't want to get caught up, uh, like I mentioned a minute ago, in a political debate or in the minutia. You want to get clear about your values, that you want to represent everyone in the class and the community. You want to make sure all students feel seen and accepted. Um, you remind yourself that you are doing the right thing in making sure that your class library is inclusive. If you were to fail to include materials that reflect diverse identities, that would really be a form of bias that you are not addressing. And it could even be considered a form of discrimination. Not that that would be your intent, but that could be real, that's sort of the outcome, right? When you take the time to curate a representative and inclusive library, you are teaching from an informed and a deeply caring perspective. If you avoid inclusive books out of fear of repercussions from maybe angry, outspoken parents, then you are teaching from a place of fear. And your students deserve you to teach from a place of caring and uh, an informed perspective for their own good. They deserve you coming from um, the intent of helping them feel a sense of belonging. So always choose love over fear and you can feel good knowing that you really are doing something significant to make this world a better place. So um, before we get to the survey, uh, I want to open it up. We have a few minutes for any questions or any thoughts. You can just unmute yourself if you'd like to um, or put anything in the chat. Good morning, Dr. Ralph. Hi. I like your books, especially the one about the family. It's a family because I grew up with my father and my grandmother. Yeah. And two aunties, no, three aunties, one cousin. And that okay, was my yeah. family when I was growing up. Uh -huh. Then I came to the United States and I, I met my mother, my stepfather, and two half sisters. And so many uncles and aunties. Yeah. So that was nice. Yes. I also liked it, the one with um, a friend for Henry. That uh -huh. was nice. Cause I work, yeah. in a, I work in a school and I, I tend to work with many of the kindergarten children and sometimes we get children that, like Henry uh -huh. that are just trying to find a friend. So I like that book very much. I think I'm going to read it next time I go back and do an activity. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It really is a great book. It's so cute and written from the kids' perspectives. Uh, I like that one as well. Any other thoughts or questions? Hi. Hi. <laughs> 
Um, I just wanted to say thank you for having this talk and sharing all these resources because I've been I'm a new teacher ish newish mm -hmm. um, trying to expand my library and my classroom to be a little more diverse. Um, and I like that you pointed out because I inherited this big library, but they were there are a lot of books that are um, I want to say outdated, but not as diverse as we can have it. Um, so I think it was good for you to say like, oh, we can keep them, but have a discussion about them. Um, especially since I had donated some and I'm still left with a few that I'm like, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think also giving us that question of, is it going to hurt mm -hmm. um, or harm students? Um, that's definitely going to help me with looking at these books differently and seeing if I should keep them or not. Mm -hmm. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, definitely. All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much for coming. And if you could just take two minutes to um, complete uh Thank you. To complete the survey, uh, this helps ensure that we continue getting funding and we can continue to offer you these professional development opportunities. So let me put the, um, the link in the chat if you want to get it that way, or you can use the QR code. And while you're doing that next week, you guys, uh, you probably got my email about it. But uh, we have an in-person workshop put on by our Department of Special Education on campus. And we've got four different workshops going on. You get to choose two to go to. It's on Saturday, August 6th from 9 to noon. Um, so you can uh, register where you register for this one. Or if you lost that, you can just email me directly. Let me put my email in the chat too, just in case any of you ever want to reach out. And uh, we'd love to have you there. We still have some spots available. So uh, if you have, if you're free next uh, week, then uh, let me stop recording too. It, then um, then uh, we'd love to have you.